is now at the University of Frankfurt. We started 16 years ago to, to make aptimus available that, that are, can be controlled by, by light. So we used the caging uncaging approach with the photo label groups. And we introduced these photo label groups like them at different positions with the thrombin aptimus as shown here, but also with other aptimus that we did bind to cells or to, to other proteins. And thereby we, we show that it is indeed possible to do this either by introducing these moieties at positions that direct interact with the protein or at positions that interfere with the, with the conformation of the aptimer. So however, um, what we realized of course is that these chemical groups that we are introducing have some limitation if it comes for biological applications. So of, first and foremost, they require synthesis, which per se is of course not a disadvantage. Uh, but you need to have access to, to, to a chemistry lab to implement this, to synthesize it and everything. So this can be laborious at, at one end. So, and also what we, I think what is the most limitation is, is that these uncaging products that are uncaged from these type of, of, of photo label groups, they can be very toxic. They have, these are nitrosa groups, there are others, but they can have side products that can have in a cell, different uh, secondary effects that, that are unwanted. And what we have observed, at least with the caged aptimers that we have developed in the past years, is that they are hardly applicable inside cells and, and even harder applicable in animals. So we tried a lot of experiments with, with embryos from Drosophila and injected caged aptimers, but these it never turned out very well for us, in our hands at least. So what we started then, I'd say I think 10 years ago is we, we thought about approaches how we can get in hands of systems that are fully genetically um, encodable and allow a, a light control of, of, of RNA and of RNA aptimers inside cells. So in, at that time we came across a, a protein family. These are the so-called love domain protein families. These are photoreceptors. And one of the, the worst, first examples is shown here. So this is the light oxygen voltage photoreceptor from Avena sativa. And but it, this, these are domains that are found in different proteins and they all function in a very similar manner. So they have a FMN cofactor that is non-covalently bound to the photoreceptor in darkness. If we irradiate this protein with blue light, around 460 nanometers in this range, then the protein undergoes a conformational change that is induced by a covalent bond formation between the cysteine residue of the protein and the FMN cofactor. And the, the, what it does on the conformation level, it unfolds the J-alpha helical structure and the A-alpha helical structure by, by breaking some of the, of the amino acid interactions in, so the intramolecular interactions. And this is fully reversible. If you put back the protein from the blue light, irradiated status, the dark status, it goes back almost fully. So a, a, a colleague of mine, Andreas Möglich, he identified a, 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 a love domain protein, which is called PAL, which has a, a very unique architecture. So in most pro photoreceptor proteins, the love domain is N-terminal to an adjacent functional domain. This can be kinase domains, it can be DNA binding domains, etc. But in this PAL protein, the, the architecture is different. So this PAL protein has a PAS domain shown here on top, has a central anter domain, which is an RNA binding domain, and has a LAF domain at the C terminus that is responsible for, and as seen here, for gaining access to the anter domain. And this, what you see here, is a dimeric structure of the protein, so that the protein always exists in a dimer. So we have been so using the septimer in our lab and started. And, and selection procedure to gain to get aptimers that bind to the protein in a light dependent manner. So the selection scheme was relatively straightforward. So we immobilized the protein on, on microtiter plates and under blue light conditions. So in the irradiated state, we, we added the library, we washed the non-bound species, we removed the unbound species, but then for the recovery process, we just put the plate in darkness, allowing the protein to convert to its dark adapted state and thereby kicking out those aptimers that bind only exclusively to the light adapted version. So this bound RNA has been 
um, RT-PCR to amplify transcribed. Into, so we did a pre-selection step for streptavidin, and then but we went through the cycle and we did run about 15 selection cycles, did a, a very extensive NGS data analysis. And in the end, we came up with two RNA motifs. So these are the two motifs that almost dominated the libraries. And um, they are very similar, as you can see here. So they are truly hairpin structures. So we cut them short to 17 nucleotides or 19 nucleotides. And you can see here on the left side that they bind in a light dependent manner to the pulp protein. So there's the O4 aptamer binds on the light and also almost you can see no binding in darkness with the 53. It's kind of different in this type of experiment. So we have seen a bit of residual activity in darkness, but a much stronger activity under light conditions. And we did extensive exemplary shown here for the 53 abdomen. What we know from these hairpins so far is that the loop nucleotides, they are very essential for binding. So if you mutate the mute loop nucleotides, so all the red dotted positions here, you see that you lose binding capacity quite effectively. We also need the stem structure here. So which is not very critical in nucleotide identity, but for the UG, that's a nucleotide that you need. So you need the space pair here. If you replace the U by a C, then you lose binding completely. And for some of the nucleotides, there, there's tolerance here. And so this, that's, that's what we know so far. And for all, so I boxed here the M21 A to U mutate, mutated version. So this is the mutant that we have used subsequently in all the biological and most of the biological assays as a non-binding control. And so, uh, and whenever I pinpoint to a controlled experiment that we have done in, in, in the cells, we have been using the Zaptima variant um, to refer to. So what we, despite the two motives, so the O4 Aptima on the left and the 53 Aptima on the right are very similar. So they indeed share some sequence homology. So this, HECA motif, you can find it here as well. We also have in both the UG motif that is required. But despite these similarities, we have also found that there are dissimilarities. So, and this comes at least in terms of kinetics. So what we see that O4 binds very quickly. So it has a rapid on rate, it also has a more rapid off rate. Whereas 53 has a slower on rate and a very much slower off rate. And we also know that the sensitivity towards magnesium ions is a bit higher for the 53 and compared to the O4 aptima. So what we wanted to do with these aptimers, we wanted to use them in, in, in mammalian cells and to, to control gene expression. So, and PAL protein is a protein that has been found in, in Nacumorella, which is in bacteria. So what the first step, what we did to get towards this direction is we expressed an m cherry fusion protein with PAL in mammalian cells. You can see here the, the m cherry fluorescence on the left. You can see the fluorescence of the PAL protein. Just remember, so it has an FMN chromophore, which is responsible for its fluorescence in, of the PAL. You can see this here very nicely, and that's the merge picture. So if you now do, so what we need to investigate is whether this Express protein is also functional, at least in terms that it can switch, can be switched um, to one of the two conformations in, under light and, and, and dark conditions. So and this can be easily followed because the PAL protein has this intrinsic fluorescence, but this fluorescence will be destroyed upon the, the covalent bond formation with the FM chromophore and the cysteine residue, because the pi electron system is then disrupted. So that's exactly what you can see. So if you, that's before radiation on the left here, in the middle panel, you see after radiation for one minute with blue light, you see that the fluorescence of the pulp protein is almost gone. And if you put it back in darkness and after you can see the fluorescence coming back after five minutes. So this means we have a system in hand in which we can express a, a, the pulp effector protein inside cells, it's still functional. You can switch it back and forth. And we have very short hairpin RNA molecules that we, we can embed in different ways and in, in, in other RNA molecules inside cells. And that's exactly what we did. So we, we did a first experiment where we embedded the aptamers, the PAL aptamer, and every data I'm showing you right now is with the 53 aptamer, and into the 5' UTR of ML, mRNAs. And we, we shifted the position a bit from very close to the start codon to very close to the, to the cap structure. And we also played a little bit with the stem sizes, have a more stable or a less stable system. 
And so the best system that we found was when in the was the UTR5, which is here, which is the, the cap proximal position. And you can see that we can compare to the control. So this is the single point within control, can clearly shut off gene expression when we irradiate the sample compared to the dark state of the sample. So this was a nice experiment to show that the system is functional inside cells. And we moved on and we did a similar system just as, as Beatrix explained with having short hairpin RNAs, which are expressible RNAs that um, can exert SI RNA activity. So these are expressed as short hairpins, as you can see them here, with an apical loop structure using polymerase 3 promoter systems. When you transfect those plasmids into cells, these RNA hairpins are transcribed in the nucleus, they are transported into the cytoplasm, and in the cytoplasm then they are um, they are um, digested by DICER and incorporated into the risk complex and lead to a reduction of gene expression by, by RNA interference. So what we did is we replaced the apical loop structures with the, with the polyoptomers, and thereby we gained light control of the activity of these hairpins. So this is then an inducible system. So we, in the mRNA system, we had a repression. In this system with the SHRNAs, we have an induction of gene expression because we thought, or we think, we haven't proven this, but we think PAL, once bound to the, to the apical loop domain here, under light condition, it's, it's inhibiting the processing and the mat further maturation of this irony, as you can see here. So in this is what you see here, that's the control, that's the induction by light uh, of, of the system, so we can induce gene expression. And the third system, which I just want to touch briefly is, and what we also did is we implemented those hairpins in the hairpin and, and, and tetra loop positions of the guide RNAs of the CRISPR DCAS9 system. So in the system, you have a guide sequence. You have the, the, guide RNA, the guide sequence that brings the RNA together with the DCAS9 to a promoter position in the genes. And then if you have the PAL aptomers here and have a fusion protein of the PALs with transactivation domains, you can light dependently recruit those um, transactivation domains to the promoter side, thereby inducing gene expression. And you can see this here from this first graph that it works nicely. So that's a dark expression state and that's after irradiation with light. And that's a comparison with a system that has been published by other groups previously. And this does not have light control. So you see here, we gain light control of gene expression using the system. What you also could show is using the parallel optimal system and here in the sense of this HRNAs, that we can have spatial control of gene expression. So that's a very primitive example, but we have used just a, a photo, handmade photo mask that you put on or cell culture during the irradiation process. And you can see that these shapes here, the eyes and the mouth, you, you can nicely see, detect them, but this was not very tight. So it still can have spatial expression. And what we also can, despite reported genes, we can ex control the expression of, of endogenous genes. And we have, I can show you two examples here, one using the SHRNA approach. So we, we control the cell cycle for the cell cycle progression, progression from G1 to S, G2 to M. So at least for G2 to M, we know that there's protein complex necessary between CDK1 and cyclin B1. So if you knock out cyclin B1, this will result in an increased number of cells that are in the G2, uh, rest in the G2 phase. So we constructed as HRNAs that are responsive to the PAL, but also will lead to the down regulation of the cyclin B1. And that's what you can see here. So that's Western blot analysis. So in darkness, you see low expression of the gene, of the protein, of course, because the HRNAs are fully functional. And the light control, so in the irradiation condition, you see that the protein is upregulated, kind of. These are the controls for these conditions. And we're using a point mutant, you see that these, the amount of proteins are almost even and at very low quantities. And you can quantify using flow cytometry and you see that when we do this, we under, under darkness, you have an arrest in the G2 phase, you have more cells in the G2 phase compared to the light irradiated state, where you can see a reduction of cells that are arrested in the G2 phase. We can also control um, endogenous genes using the CRISPR-Cas system. So this is a, one example that we did, we were regulating the human ACL1 gene, where Chris from our lab tested several guide RNAs that located different positions within the promoter region of this gene. And two of them, number two and four, have been shown that they work nicely in induction of gene expression, and we can even combine them and have an 
much stronger induction of gene depression in this case. So that's what we have done so far. And, and what, what we then strive to build this is about the question, so what is the natural target sequence of PAL in Nakamorella? So this is still unknown. And because the PAL protein is from Nakamorella multipartitita, and it should have a target site in, in, these, um, in this bacteria as well. So it has an antidomain. Antidomains are known as RNA binding domains, and they are known having an impact in the alternation of transcription. So what we did based on the data that we generated by Celex and the motifs we identified and all the mutation analysis we've done, we created a gene search, search pattern and used this pattern here and searched the genome from Nacomorella for sequences in the DNA that are also then transcribed into RNA. And we found one sequence, which is looking very similar to this pattern here, but a bit of difference, which we called NM60. And this sequence is located in the 5 from UTR of a potato sense protein. And now, so what's happening now is that Andreas Möckig at the University of Bayreuth, he's going to functionally validate, because they have the bacteria and everything over there, whether this um, is the true target, whether it's just a prediction right now, whether it is the true target in the bacteria, and what kind of biological consequences result from binding to PAL and gene expression that are downstream located. What we did at our end is, we searched our NGS data from the previous selection that we have done, whether we will find this sequence as well in our library. And indeed, we did. So we found the sequence now that's called 58, which is perfectly matching this, this pattern here. And so that we, we didn't investigate this previously because we just thought that it's a, it's a, a variation of the 53 and 04 sequence. But now finding out that these sequences are so different, so we, we went on with the sequence. And what we did is we did some binding data using fluorescence and isotropy. So this is the 04 aptamer and this is the 53 aptamer we have identified and characterized previously and used so far in, in cells. And you see that both have affinities in the 12 and 17 nanomolar range. So the 58 aptamer in turn is a bit, has a bit higher affinity, so four to five times higher has a bit of different curves, so it's, it reaches saturation much more earlier, but also have a kind of portion that goes up again. We don't think that as a second binding site, we just think that there's an overlay of the, of, of the unspecific binding, but we, have no, we haven't done any structural data that we can delineate from there right now. But it has a high affinity and it has a stronger discrimination between the dark and the light state. So Georg in our lab used this aptamer and constructed an, another system using aptosymes that are embedded in the three prime UTR of a reported gene here and used this to, to regulate gene expression in mammalian cells. So what, what the, the rationale behind this is that we implemented the PAL binding aptomer, the 55 aptomer, into a hammerhead ribosome, the stem three of the hammerhead ribosome, which if the ribosome is active, so there will be cleavage, self-cleavage. So this would mean that the mRNA loses the poly A tail and thereby translation will be inhibited. So now we then we needed to test whether the activation of PAL with light will lead then to binding there and to lead to either induction or repression of gene expression. And what we found out so far is that, so these are the control experiments. So if you express EGFP without the, the hammerhead, or the aptosyme and the 3 prime UTR, you see no light control. So you, you see always expression, of course, if you express it um, with the hammerhead ribosome, just the, the white type hammerhead ribosome, you always see a reduction of gene expression due to the cleavage here. If you use a mutated version of the hammerhead ribosome that lacks self cleavage activity, you see always expression, of course, in the light and darkness. If you embed the 58 aptomer here in the stem three, you see a, a lower expression in darkness. So this means that the cleavage activity is not that active of this ribosome. But if you add light and allow PAL for binding to the sequence here, you see a reduction of, of, of activity. This means that the PAL binding to this aptosome seems to induce self-cleavage activity. If you do this with the point mutant, again, we created a point mutant of this. You see no, no interference here. OK, so that's where we are right now. Um, so. So this was quick, I guess. So we, I just showed you that we constructed a pile system that can be used in different ways to control gene expression. 
in cells using the SH RNA, M RNA, CRISPR, DCAS, but also the aptosome. So this puts the ribo into the optoribogenetics, I guess. Though I think we can do much more with this. And we have now a service system that can be used as an on and off switch or vice versa for, to, to control their RNAi, translation, aptosomes, and so on. So what we're doing right now, and Tichel is doing this from our lab, she's trying to, to get this up and running in, 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 in flies. So as a first model system, we have some corporations going on with C. elegans. And we would like to use this to control neuronal activity. And on a side note, so whatever I told you right now, in, besides the 58 and the 53, so we have these three hairpins, 04, 53, and 58. And what we have found out is that they behave very differently. So Andreas in Bayreuth, he used all these aptomers and bacteria to control gene expression. And what we can say right now is that the 04 aptomer almost exclusively performs very well in bacteria, but does not perform very well in eukaryotes. Whereas the 53 aptomer works more nicely in the eukaryotic cells, it does not work that nicely in bacteria. And 58 seems to work equally well in bacteria and mammalian cells. We have no idea why this is the case, but we are about to find out. I guess we do some structural studies to get an idea why this is that's really happening. So with this, this left me with the acknowledgement to the people who have done all the work. So this is the our OptoRibo team, uh, Georg, Sebastian, Christian, and Anna, who started all this, uh, I think, six years ago. And Teichal, who is continuing this right now with the, with the annual experiments of the Trisophila. These are the people who gave the money for this experiment, and I thank you for your attention.